Y'all planning for this? Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special edition of Reading Time with Jarvis. Normally in this episode, I highlight other books and resources that I have read that have made an impact on my practice. But today I want to highlight for you my own book, Deliver Massive Value. And actually what I want to do is play for you a snippet or two from my audio book, the sections that have had the biggest impact on my practice. Now, obviously, they've all had an impact on my practice or they would not have made it to the audiobook. But I wanted to give you a taste of the audiobook so that hopefully and most importantly, you can take these lessons that have had such an impact on my practice and implement them in your own practice. Because as always, it is only the things that you implement, only the action you take that counts. Enjoy. Scrap your elevator pitch. Financial advisors receive a lot of terrible advice. Comes with a job, I guess. But one of the most common pieces of bad advice given to financial advisors is that we need a snappy elevator pitch prepared so we can share it with everyone we meet. It sounds like a good idea on the surface, but like most bad advice, this one almost always comes from self-proclaimed experts who don't even have any clients. The exact details vary, but here's the gist. When someone casually asks you, what do you do, you're supposed to respond with something like this. I provide comprehensive wealth management services to a select group of families. Now, if this sounds like good advice to you, it's only because it's been shoved down your throat so many times that you've had no choice but to swallow the Kool-Aid. And hey, no shame. They teach this stuff in business schools all over the country. In fact, Someone somewhere is probably cornering an unsuspecting dinner party guest right now with their own elevator pitch, and it's probably just as mystifying as the line above. Now, I'll confess that I myself fell victim to this bad advice for many years. In fact, the exact line used above used to be my own elevator pitch. Sadly, I spent many years and blew many potential relationships by using elevator pitches with no results. Actually, it was worse than that. It branded me as a desperate salesperson. So how is it possible that I, a relatively personable and somewhat charming individual, and objectively a very good financial advisor, came up with zeros whenever I attempted to deploy this time-tested piece of business advice? John Barron, my friend, longtime business coach, and guest on the Perfect RA podcast, summed this up perfectly in one of our episodes— number 79, if you want to look it up yourself. And he said, we've been, as a culture in America, pitched so many times that it's something that people will go out of their way to avoid. It's the single biggest barrier to people wanting to engage with you. If you listen to the real pros as they navigate social settings, you'll find they never answer the what do you do with an elevator pitch. Pretty much everyone gives a confident one or two word answer, such as, doctor, attorney, teacher, computer programmer, or truck driver. These professionals have figured out something the experts still haven't managed to grasp. Elevator pitches are intrusive and obnoxious, and no one wants to put someone else in an uncomfortable situation. When you launch right into your elevator pitch, you become an anomaly, an outsider. Worse, you've now abused the relationship by offering more than you were asked. Not a great way to get invited to the next party what to do instead. By keeping others' comfort in mind and respecting their time, it's possible to have rewarding conversations with people around you and even walk away with a few business cards. So how should you answer the what do you do question when a new acquaintance asks you over cocktails? Directly and to the point without a smack of salesmanship. These days when I'm asked, I initially tell people one of these two phrases. Option one, I run an investment firm or option two, I'm a consultant. Both are brief, accurate, and to the point. There's no pitch, and each objectively true statement rolls off my tongue as smoothly and confidently as if it were my middle name. I've seen a few longer versions work, but you have to be smooth to pull this off. As such, it's not for amateurs. Here are a few examples. I teach people to retire. Benjamin Brandt, Retirement Starts Today podcast. I work with Australian expats, Ashley Murphy. 
I help dentists buy practices, Brian Hanks. These slightly longer answers work only because there is no shorter way of saying it. They also work because they create a ton of curiosity in the right audience. After you offer your short, polite company answer with a short, non-salesy explanation of your position, one of two things will happen. In this first scenario, they'll smile, respond with a polite, that's nice, and then head off to finish their meatballs. In this case, you did the right thing by holding back. You answered the question they were really asking. You gave them an accurate answer that helps them place you and your work in the right context, and you didn't come off like a salesperson. Scenario two, if you're speaking with someone whose business interests or network might really align with yours, they'll get curious. They'll sit forward, eyebrows raised. When they lob you the follow-up question, you'll know you're home free. Well, what does that mean? Like a hedge fund? There it is. Now is the time to go into details. Now you're still on borrowed time, but you've been given permission to expand a little. However, it's even more important to not blow it and say the wrong thing. So how should you be answering? Enter the fast pitch. This is your second chance and it's where the magic can happen, but only if your message is perfectly crafted and honed to perfection. Whatever their follow-up question, you now have permission to expand on your initial answer and take up a bit more of your company's attention. My response, which I only give to interested parties who have given me permission to expand on this very short version by saying something like, you mean a hedge fund, is this. Well, not really. When people retire, I help them not get killed in taxes. Now, here is why this is pure gold. If the person is not thinking about retirement and or is not concerned about taxes, they say, oh, that's interesting, and we both move on. However, if they are thinking about retirement or taxes, they get really, really curious. Suddenly, a stream of questions comes out, which then gives me permission to expand one final time. So you have a 401k or IRA, right? And they say yes. Well, the IRS is patiently waiting to take somewhere up to half of your account in taxes. Part of my job is to make sure this doesn't happen. Now the hook is set. This random person who would have run away immediately if I had led with, I help families minimize their lifetime tax bills using a proprietary strategy, a line by the way I've actually heard recommended by an expert, is instead insanely curious and practically begging me for more information. But that's it. You've played your cards, the game is over, and now it's time for everyone to get back to their meatballs. You're getting questions, so why stop? When you strike prospecting gold during your leisure activities, it's tempting to start them down your prospect process right then and there. But no matter how eager your audience, you must stop the conversation. Any and all future questions during this meeting need to be responded with, I'm here to, whatever the activity, and not to talk business. If you have questions, give my office a call to schedule a time to chat. Why is it so important to stop? Because no other professional will let a casual conversation turn into a business call. Need an example? Here's a true story from one of my retired doctor clients. Random party guest. Well, what do you do? Doctor. I'm a doctor. Simple answer. Random party guest. Cool. What kind of doctor? Giving him permission to expand. Professional. I'm a heart surgeon at the local hospital. Notice the simple response. Random party guest lifts shirt. By the way, this is a true story. I have this funny heartbeat. Would you take a listen and let me know if it's serious? Doctor, are you kidding me? Put your shirt back on and call 911 if you're having heart problems. Don't let even the most adamant of potential clients turn your party into a consultation. Using this approach, not the heart attack one, but using the short intro line, I've gotten clients from boating, partying, rock climbing, dirt biking, mountain biking, charity events, my kids' school, working out, social activities, barbecues, and most anywhere else I go. Later in this book, you'll learn tips for narrowing your services down into a niche. In addition to helping you identify a market to focus on dominating, having a strong niche makes it easier to develop your fast pitch. I hope you've enjoyed this snippet from Deliver Massive Value, the Financial Advisor's Guide. If you want to listen to the rest of the book, you can go to Amazon.com to buy the Audible, or you can visit my website, MatthewJarvis.com, to download the first two chapters as a PDF, to buy the paperback version, which I'd be glad to sign for you, or to download a PDF version of the entire book. So that's MatthewJarvis.com, 
or Amazon.com if you want the Kindle or Audible version. Happy planning. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. Information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. The perfect RIA, the perfect RIA.